Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I gave a message a couple of weeks ago on the purpose of man explained. And today I would like to do the purpose of man explained part two. <laughs> part two lineage. And it's kind of like if as a child do you ever do one of those connect the dots papers where you have like a hundred and you have to go one to two. This is kind of the connected dot with the lineage. So I have many, many scriptures here. Most of them I'm going to go through pretty quick. But just to show uh, when we're looking at the purpose of man to really, really understand the concept that after Genesis 3 and the, the fall of man, it really was a whole different plan until we get to the New Testament in the Bratata Shah. So just to rehash, if anybody's listening to this who didn't listen to part one, please listen to part one because uh, it'll make this one make more sense to that. Uh, and just going over very, very briefly, like we said, if you're looking in Genesis, you have to understand the difference of the word Adom, which means mankind. It's not a name of a person per se, although the first man was called Adom. But uh, basically, most of the time, Adom literally is simply mankind. We see not just in Genesis, but throughout the Bible, as we'll see in some other scriptures. And when the perfect article is there, Ha, the, the uh, Ha Adom, it is talking about the specific man. And like we said, if you're looking at, uh, in scripture, uh, just like the virgin birth, you know, Ha Oma, the virgin. It's not just a virgin, because... You know, anyone could be a virgin, but it's the virgin. So when you have that perfect article there, it's talking about a specific one. So if we start in Genesis 126, and Elohim said, let us make man in our image. Okay, the plural there, we're not going to go into that today, but Elohim being the father and the son at creation according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the heaven, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over all the creepers on the earth. And Elohim created the man, Ha'adom, in his own image, in the image of Elohim, he created him, and then, period, and then the next sentence says, he created them, male and female. So like we were saying, you have Ha'adom, the man, who's uh, taken from Adom, mankind them, male and female. And like I said many times, the man is in the image and the likeness of Elohim. Uh, if we read our note there, the man was made in the image of Yahweh as he has two hands and feet and two eyes, etc. However, to be made in Yahweh's likeness denotes to have the character that he has, and that does not come by instantaneous fiat, but by a lifelong commitment to conquer one's falling human nature. To build patience and self-control, and to 100% fully submit to the spirit of Yahweh and his Torah on how to love and worship him and how to love our neighbor as ourself. So the image is one thing, the likeness is something else. But the point I really want to do is really show the purpose here was Yahweh was colonizing. He was colonizing the earth. Uh, in Matthew 6, uh, what is called the Father's Prayer, right? So then you should pray this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, as it is in heaven, also on the earth. So from Genesis, we do see that the Heavenly Father is colonizing the earth. So we see that heaven was never given to mankind. You never see anywhere in Scripture that mankind is told heaven is going to be his reward or is going to be given. It's the earth. And man is given rulership, he's not given ownership. So these are basic premises that are set down when we're looking at the purpose of man. And then let's continue. Genesis 2.5. And every shrub of the field was not yet on the earth, and every plant of the field had, yet, had not yet sprung up. For Yahweh Elohim had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. No one from mankind, literally, to till the ground. So it's kind of interesting when you look at Genesis as literal. I do believe there's a literal garden, literal trees, everything's literal. But also I believe there's a lot of allegory there. So if the purpose of man was to bear fruit and multiply, right? And now he's saying that here's, there's every shrub uh, of the field was not yet on the earth and every plant had not yet sprung up, right? Why? Because Yahweh had not sent rain. What is the rain? The Holy Spirit, right? When Yeshua is pouring out his spirit. So the spirit of Yahweh is not there. Why? 
Because there's no man to till the ground. There's no man to bring it. There's no man to bring that spirit. Very easy. Then you get in verse 15. And what does Yahweh do? Yahweh not only took Ha'adom, the man, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So literally the same words used for Shabbat, you know, that we are to keep the Shabbat. Uh, it's the same word used here. So now he's putting a man there to work it and to keep it. And again, what is the man's purpose? Chapter 1 and verse 28. Elohim blessed them and Elohim said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the land. And subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, and over the beasts creeping on the earth. So the purpose of man was to bear fruit and multiply. Over here, the first in the garden, it can't happen. There's no shrubs, right? There's only seeds, but no shrub was up. No plant was yet done. Why? Because there's no rain, living water, and there's no man to bring it. So I think this is pretty simple to understand. And then what happens? Genesis 3, uh, we know the man fails, Adam and Eve. The, and, and what the sin really is here, of course, they're basically, Yahweh said, don't eat of this tree. They ate of it. But really, when you look at it, what they did was, the failure was a lack of faith in Yahweh. Because Yahweh told them one thing, and the serpent said something else. He said, no, you're not going to die if you do that. Yahweh is lying to you. And they took the word of the serpent over Yahweh. And what came out of that? Verse 17 and 18. I'm not going to get into all of what was cursed on the woman, cursed on the serpent, but more cursed on the man, because this is what we're going over, the purpose of man. And he said to the man, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat, the ground will be cursed because of you. And you shall eat it of sorrow all the days of your life. Very interesting. The ground will be cursed. And as we see, when we get into Luke, that is the parallel explaining this from Yeshua, the parable of the sower and the seed. What's the first thing Luke tells us in Luke 8, 11? Here's the parable. The seed is the word of Yahweh. The seed is the word of Yahweh. That's the pattern. So when he's saying over here, the ground will be cursed because of you, what is he saying? It's not going to be the way it was before. Before, there wouldn't have been thorns and thistles, right? And this is what he's telling him. You'll eat of it all the days of your life in sorrow, and you'll bring forth thorns and thistles, and you will eat the plain of the field. So he tells us exactly what the thorns and thistles are in Luke. He says the thorns and thistles are the cares of the world and the love for money and the other things coming in. So very, very clearly you could look at this, and because of this sin... It wasn't going to be so easy to bear the fruit, right? The ground shall be cursed because of you. The seed would not just automatically come up. The weeds are automatically coming up. We don't have to do anything for them, but the fruit. So the work is going to be hindered. The seed is the word of Yahweh, the thorns and thistles, the cares of life, and the mammoths choke it. So let's go back now to Genesis 2 in verse 17. Because why did this happen? Why was the work going to be hindered? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat, for in the day you eat of it, surely you shall die. So we know there's two trees there, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Yahweh basically told him, you're not to eat of this tree, and the day you eat of that tree, you will die. And then we get to Genesis 3, in verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. Because what is the serpent asking? Aren't you allowed to eat of all the trees in the garden? And she's saying, of the fruit of the trees we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, Elohim has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, surely you will not die. So the serpent says, Elohim lied, and they will not die, and they believe him. And like I said, so really what the big problem here is a lack of faith, and that's why we're going to see the everlasting covenant from here is going to be based on faith. It's not going to be based on uh, a certain tree that you can eat or can't eat. It's going to be based on the problem. It's going to be based on the cause, not the effect. And the cause of it is a lack of faith. And that's the key to the everlasting covenant here. And it's the key to the everlasting covenant when we get into the Brit Uh So now the curse comes. After this, the curse comes. As soon as they eat and they show the lack of faith in Yahweh, they believe the serpent over Yahweh, the curse has come. And it's very interesting, because up to this time, the woman doesn't have a name either. The man is Ha'adom, and Adom, you know, 
may or may not be his name, depending on what commentary you listen to. I believe he probably was called Adom, uh, you know, even though it's also the name for mankind. But certainly the woman did not have a name. She was Isha. She was just the woman. So it's very interesting that when she's created, she has no name. And now they find out, you're not going to live forever, you're going to die. Right? And right after that, right after they get the curse, what's the first thing that Adam says to her? You know, it's the first verse after the, all the cursings come. It's in verse 20. And the man, Ha'adom, called the name of his wife, Hava, life, not because she was the mother of all living, but because she became the mother of all living. So why would he call her Hava now? Because of verse 15. Because first he tells them, no, I was right, you are going to die. And they're very, very sad they're going to die. He says, but, but, I'm a redeemer, I'm a restorer. And he gives them verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to the serpent and the seed of the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. So the very first messianic prophecy is coming. So now... First they're told they're going to die, but now they say, no, no, you're not going to die because you're going to have a child and that child is going to redeem the earth. There will be a seed. And that's the whole thing I'm going to talk about today, the lineage, the seed. Because from here now, everything changes. We have chapter 1 and 2, which was the purpose of man. And now the purpose of man is going to take a detour. And I want to show you that detour all the way until we hit the Brit shop. The detour never changes. The detour is lineage from this point on. And wherever we deter from the lineage, it's because Satan is trying to destroy the lineage. As we see, right? What did he do when Moses was born? Moses is going to be the servant of Yahweh. He tries to kill the seed, the lineage. And even Yeshua, that's the last step, because Yeshua was the second Adam. He tried to do the same thing. So from this point on, we're going to take a detour into the lineage. But she becomes the mother of all living because she is the one that will actually bear a child that will be the Messiah. Now, she's thinking the child she bears is him. She's not thinking it's going to be child after child after child. She's thinking it will be him. So what happens? We get to chapter 4, and what are we told? Ha'adom, the man, knew his wife, Hava, the woman who became life, and she conceived and bore a child, and what did they call him? Kine. And said, I have gotten a man, Yahweh. So she's thinking, this is the Messiah. This is the Yahweh man. This is the one who's going to redeem. How do we know it? Just look at the name. Kine literally means to purchase, to redeem, to buy back what was lost. So the fact that they call him that, and then she continues to bear his brother. They're twins. And what does she call him? Havel. Nothingness, meaningless, vanity. Why would she call them that? Because there's only a prophecy of one seed. And we'll see that when we get to Galatians. It's not seed many, it's seed one. The word in Hebrew, zera, it is always singular. But it could be singular like the nation of Israel, or it could be singular as one person. And when we get to the book of Galatians, we very, very clearly see the seed is not talking to a nation. It's talking about one particular seed, the second Adam. So it's really interesting here when you look at the names that she's thinking this is the one. Cain is the one. He is the savior. He's the redeemer, the, the re repairer, the restorer. That's literally what that word means. And they don't need help. A matter of fact, and I went over this before, but I'll go over it again. When you're looking at lineage, if you take the first 10 names of lineage, because right after this, right, right after you get to chapter 4, and again, the plane gets thwarted because Cain kills his brother, and then Cain gets cast out. What's the very next thing we come back to? We come back to lineage. Why? Why would we have to get the lineage here of who Adam had and who his son had and who his son had? Because the promised seed didn't come yet. And this is the point. From Genesis chapter 3, everything is about lineage. Every single thing is about lineage. Because until you get the second Adam, there's no purpose of man anymore. There's not a purpose of man until you get the second Adam to come and fulfill the job that the first Adam failed. So everything from here, although we'll have stories and side stories and things that will happen, everything is about that lineage. So when we go to the first ten names of chapter 5 of Genesis, it's Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalael, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And what do those names mean? 
Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh means mortal, Kenan means sorrow, Mahalael means the blessed Elohim, Jared means shall come down, Enoch means teaching, Methuselah means his death shall bring, Lamech means to long after or despairing, and Noah means comfort or rest. So when you put that together, it says, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed Elohim shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the long death to rest. And you say, how did the rabbis miss this one? They have all the insights to absolutely everything except what matters. How on earth can you miss this? Because everything is about lineage, the name kind being the restorer, the repairer that she's thinking. And in the first ten names, you have the whole plan of salvation that's there. And that's why, why does, uh, and if you look in these stories, we don't have time today, but read it. You'll see that when Lamech has Noah, he's thinking Noah is going to be the Messiah. And that's why he calls him the comfort of the rest. And yet we know that Noah was not the promised Messiah that was there. So now we continue, right? Let's go to chapter 6. Now we get into Noah. And it came about that Ha-Adom began to multiply in the face of the earth. So now we know that. We know that not before Adam and, and not before Cain and Abel, there's nothing that says they had any children before, but Cain kills Abel, and then what happens? They have Seth who replaces Abel, but then afterwards they said he lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. Who knows how many, but many, probably many. But one thing here is they're multiplying. We're seeing, right, that the descendants of Ha'adom began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. So it said that in, Gen in Genesis 5, in the genealogy, he had sons and daughters afterward. The sons of the Elohim saw the daughters of Ha'adom, that they were good, and took wives for themselves from all those whom they chose. So now it's very interesting. Who are these sons of Elohim? B'nai Elohim could be different things. They could be cherubs, maybe, right? Could be called B'nai Elohim. But they could be also the B'nai Elohim could be the, the, the line of Adam, the one who was chosen could also be B'nai Elohim. Because we see this in Genesis 32, uh, I mean in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8. It says, when the Most High divided to the nations, and that word is goyim, so it's not about Israelites here. When the Most High divided to the Goyim, the nations, their inheritance, he separated the sons of mankind. He set up the bounds of the people according to the B'nai Elohim. And again, how you translate B'nai Elohim is how you translate the verse. And I used to think it's talking about according to the cherubs of heaven. Uh, the Masoretic text puts according to the sons of Israel. Israel is not in there. That is a total mistranslation. So, but if the B'nai Elohim are also the children that Yahweh created at creation, then it's very simple what he's saying here. He separated these people around the earth, you know, according to their numbers. You know, there could have been tribes that were bigger, tribes that were smaller. So what I believe is, what he's saying here is very simple, that it's about lineage. That Yahweh meant the B'nai, that he meant the sons of Adam to keep this lineage. And because they were not keeping the lineage, there was a problem here. Satan, again, was trying to ruin the seed. He was trying to mix the lineage. So no matter what happens from here, I'm not getting into all the other things that happen, but clearly there's a problem with lineage. And how do we know? Drop down to verse 7. Because when we drop down, or first verse 5, And Yahweh saw that the evil of mankind was great on the earth, and every imagination and thoughts of his heart was only evil all day. Isn't that what Romans 5, 19 tells us? Because of Adam's failure to bring the character of Yahweh to these people, what happened? Because of his failure, they became sinners, right? Darkness is simply the absence of light. So you could put people in there that are not bad people, but if you don't give them the spirit of Yahweh, and they only have the spirit of man, they will get corrupted. How long will it take? I don't know. You know, I don't know. This is a, a while. This is hundreds and hundreds of years. But we see these people now that did not get the character of Yahweh, they were corrupted. There's no doubt about that because the Bible tells us it. And if you put all the other scriptures from the purpose of man, we know the reason why they were corrupted. Because they never got the, the character of Yahweh from Ha'adon. So Yahweh saw the evil of man was great on the earth, and every imagination and thoughts of his heart was only evil all the day. And then look at verse 8, right? 
And Noah found grace, hen is the word, you know, the word for grace, in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the generations of Noah. Boom. So why does he pick Noah? Because of lineage. <laughs> so he tells us Noah is righteous, right? He finds grace. And why is he righteous? Because he was held without blemish in his generations. And look that word of generations. It literally means family line. So Noah did not mix with the sons of mankind, the B'nai Elohim. Noah did not mix with that. Noah kept his, he was without blemish in his generations, and Noah walked with Elohim. So very clearly here, Yahweh is destroying the earth, and I'm not saying what else may or may not be happening here. There could be angelic things happening, you know, maybe, maybe not. That's not for our purpose to talk here. The purpose is very clearly what we can say is, from the scripture, that Ha'adon started multiplying on the earth, they were mixing their lineage. The people were evil. For whatever caused it, they're evil. And Noah is picked because he's a righteous man in his generations, in his lineage. His lineage is righteous. And Noah is a descendant of Ha'adom. How do we know? Because it tells us. Why would it tell us that? Because we need to know. Because everything is about lineage until the second Adam comes. If Adam fulfilled his job, you wouldn't have to have all these lineages. You know why? Because he would have went out in the world and all those other people would have been in Eden. They would have been part of the family. And that's what we're also going to see. Once the second Adam comes, you never hear a word about lineage. Not one word, ever. But before that, it's important because there has to be a second Adam. If the purpose of man is going to continue, something has to happen from Genesis 3 that comes in from there. So let's continue now to Genesis 9, now after the flood. What's the very first thing Yahweh says to Noah after the flood? Genesis 9, 1. And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. <laughs> it's the exact same thing he said to Adam and mankind in Genesis 1, 28. The exact same thing. The first thing he's telling them is to bear fruit, the purpose of man. Very, very first thing. Then we get to chapter 10, right? And what's the first thing in chapter 10? These are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, Japheth, and then he goes through all the genealogy again. Why? Because the purpose of man is all about lineage. Because there was the first Adam who failed, there had to be the second Adam. And if he didn't keep the lineage right, then the plan had failed. So he's telling the lineage, and then what happens? We go all the way down this lineage, right? The, the whole chapter basically is the lineage. Then we get to chapter 11. The Tower of Babel, that's also there. And verse 10 of chapter 11, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was a son of a hundred years. So the same thing. Back to lineage again. And then, drop down to verse 22. Who's part of this lineage? And Sarug lived 30 years and fathered Nahor. And after he fathered Nahor, Sarug lived 200 years and he fathered sons and daughters. And Nahor lived 29 years and fathered Terah. And after he fathered Terah, Nahor lived 119 years, and he fathered sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Abraham. So, wow, we're only 11 chapters into the book of Genesis, and more than half of it is only lineage. <laughs> you know, and lineage of everything. So we see lineage is extremely important in the purpose of man. So now, Abraham is shown to be part of this lineage. And what's the first thing Yahweh says to Abraham in 12? And Yahweh said to Abram, Go out from your land and from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Why? Because he had to keep his lineage. He was going to be corrupted there. Abraham's father was a pagan. Yahweh's calling him out of that. And he had to call him out of the pagan society that he was part of. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse the one despising you. And now this is the important part in verse 3 of chapter 12. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wow. So what is he telling him? There's a lineage that's going to come through Abraham, the second Adam. So the same thing as he said to Eve in chapter 315, that she would have a seed. And what did that seed continue to Noah? Noah would have a seed. And now Abraham, they're all part of the same lineage, right? If not, the purpose of man has failed. But they're all part of the same lineage. And now he's telling him all the earth will be blessed because he's going to be Ha'adom Shtaim, Ha'adom number two. 
It will be the second one. Then we get to chapter 15. And what do we see here in chapter 15? And after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will increase greatly. And Abram said, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give me? I'm going childless, and the son of the inheritance of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So he's thinking, wow, I'm getting pretty old. <laughs> you know, my wife is past childbearing. This ain't going to happen. But you know what? I do have a servant. I guess he is going to be. And Yahweh's saying, no, it doesn't work that way. And that's why I say, if Adam and he, Eve had other children after Cain and Abel, they would have to be in that lineage. In Genesis 5, you don't pick. It's, it's a seed. It's a matter of birth. It's a birthright. So the fact that there's nobody listed there in Genesis 5, it goes from Cain and Abel to Seth. It shows you there weren't other children. It's a birthright. And that's what Abraham's saying. I don't have a seed. My birthright will be... And he's like, no. I'll bless Eleazar. You know, he's going to be grafted in later. That's a whole other parable we'll do. <laughs> you know, Eleazar and the rich man... But for now, look what he says. And Abram said, Behold, you have given no seed to me. And lo, the son of my house is inheriting of me. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but he that comes forth of your own bowels shall be your heir. It's got to be a physical seed of Adam, of Noah, of Abram. And he brought him outside and said, Look now at the heavens. And recount the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said, so shall your seed be. And we went over this in the sermon, that he's showing him the Maseroth. And now he's telling him the plan of salvation. And he's showing him the whole plan of salvation and says, and by the way, Abraham, that's your seed. <laughs> and Abraham believed Yahweh and it was counted for him for righteousness. See, Adam didn't believe. And it wasn't counted for him for righteousness. Abraham believed. He didn't just believe he's going to have a son. He's believing his son is the one that's, he's telling him the story in that Mazzaro. His son is going to be the very son of Elohim. And he believed in Yahweh and it was counted to him for righteousness. So this is why, this is really, really important. Because it's not only the physical seed of the first Adam to the second Adam. It's the point of the matter of faith. Like I said, it's faith why the first Adam lost his point and his faith by the second Adam that brings it back. So Abraham, to be the father of the faithful, he would have had to show that same faith that Ha'adom didn't show. And now what happens? Genesis 24, right? Because he's saying, you know, there'll be a seed from your bowels. So what happens? Afterward, when the seed was born, when Isaac was born... Abraham knows the importance of lineage, and he tells his servant, you can't let my son, I'm going to die, don't let him marry somebody here. He's got to be in the same lineage, and look what he does. Chapter 24, and Abraham was old, going on in days, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his slave, the oldest in the house, Eleazar, the one who ruled in all that was put to him, he said, put your hand under my thigh, he's literally going to make him vow and I will cause you to swear by Yahweh Elohim of the heavens and earth, and Elohim of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanite among whom I dwell. He's not going to see Genesis 6 all over again. He's got to be faithful. They've got to keep the lineage. But you shall go to my country and my kindred and take a wife for my son, for Isaac. And the slave said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to go after me to this land. Shall I indeed bring back your son into the land from which you came out of? And Abraham said, take heed to yourself, you do not take my son back there. Because he called him out of that paganism, right? You don't go back to the paganism. We trust in Yahweh. Yahweh will make a way, right? We don't take it into our own hands. We don't violate Yahweh's commandments because it doesn't look like it's going our way. Yahweh Elohim of the heavens, who took me from the house of my father, from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me, who swore to me, saying, I will give this land to your seed. He will send his messenger before you, right? Who is the messenger of Yahweh? And you shall take a wife from there for my son. And if the woman is not willing to go after you, then you shall be clear of the oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. And the slave put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore to him concerning this thing. So this is important, right? 
Even for the fact he had to make sure that it's the wife of the son took somebody from the same seed. So let's go back down to Genesis 17, and let's see about this everlasting covenant that Yahweh is going to make. <coughs> and when Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you will increase you very greatly. And Abram fell on his face, and Elohim spoke with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations, and your name no longer will be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you very fruitful exceedingly, and I will give you four nations, and kings will come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be an Elohim to you and your seed after you. And I will give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, I will give it to you. And Elohim said to Abraham, you shall keep my covenant, you and your seed after you in your generation. So again, it's all about lineage. And he's saying, because he's telling him, be perfect, it's the same word used, perfect in his generations. You know, don't mix the seed, you have to do this. And then what does he do? He gives him a sign, literally circumcision, because circumcision is a sign of that physical seed. And that's why it's the sign of the first covenant. Because it had to be a sign of that seed. But when the new covenant comes, and the second Adam is there, and, and, and the lineage now is completed, it's not the sign anymore. What's the sign? Immersion. Because now it's about a new life, right? The purpose of man is about a new life in Yahweh. It's not about lineage. But once the first Adam failed, lineage is put in there until we get to the Brit Hadashah, until the second Adam comes. That's why I say from Genesis 3 until Matthew 1, you have a whole different plan. Everything is simply lineage. It's getting to that point where the second Adam can take over where the first Adam failed. And it's interesting if you look at this, that Adam died probably somewhere around 3000 BC, and Abraham's living around 1800 BC. So there's not really that much time. It's not like Abraham doesn't know about these things. Abraham certainly knows. He certainly knows who Adam was. He certainly knows all the things that have happened there. And he certainly knew the promise about the second Adam. There's no doubt about that. Then what happens, we go to 2 Samuel 7, because now there's the next seed that comes in here. Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has the 12 sons of Israel, and Judah becomes the seed that it's going to come through, and particular through King David. So in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 and 13, this is what Yahweh says to King David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie with your fathers, then I shall raise up your seed after you who shall come out of your loins, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And what did, what did Yahweh say to Abraham? Kings will come out of you. Who's he talking about? Ultimately, he's talking about King Messiah. Now, all the kings of Israel, King David, but ultimately, it's King Messiah that's going to come out of his loins. So we see the seed continues now through the lineage of Judah and King David. And we read... Last night, Revelation 22 and 16, right? I, Yeshua, send my cherub to testify these things to you over the congregations. I am the root and offspring of King David, the bright and morning star. Why would that be the last thing he says in Revelation? Because he's the second Adam. Because it's lineage. It's all about lineage. Yahweh is not a failure. Yahweh has to restore what mankind destroys. So now let's get to the Brit Hadashah. Let's go to Galatians 3. And like I said, what's the last act of a panicking uh, adversary, the devil, that he tries to do as Yeshua is being born? He tries to kill the seed. I'm not going to go there, but we know he inspires King Herod, and he tries to kill the seed of Yeshua. Didn't work, and the seed continued. But now we get to Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 5 through 8. That he supplying the Spirit to you and working works of power in you. Is it by works of Levitical law 
or by obedience of faith. So what happens now? The Levitical law had to be added because of transgression. So Yahweh is working through this system. You know, he knows exactly how long it will be before the seed will be born. He knows it's 1,500 years from the time of Moses. The Torah is given in all the extension of the 613 laws because he's trying to keep these people righteous to a degree so that the seed can continue. And Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to get the Torah, and he comes down and we see what's happening there. And Yahweh's thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. How do I get them from here, 1,500 years, to the second Adam? So he uses the Levitical priesthood as a bridge. It's added because of transgressions. It wasn't there part of the beginning. But what happens after 1,500 years of the Levitical priesthood, when the second Adam comes, the people say, hey, we don't need a new priesthood. We already have one. And this is the big problem in the first century, that people can't understand that the Levitical was only a shadow of the reality of Melchizedek. And this is what Paul is talking about. Never once, I challenge anybody, never once was Paul ever discussing whether you don't keep the Torah or keep the Torah. That's understood. It's always discussing, are you saved by works of the Levitical law? And it's very interesting, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they use this exact term, works of law, for animal sacrifices and the other things that go along with it? Or are you saved by faith? And that's what it comes back to, right? The animal sacrifice, because Yeshua did the first animal sacrifice, it was out of non-faith. It was from a lack of faith that Adam and Eve that caused him to have to do a sacrifice to cover their sin. So how can you be redeemed to Yahweh through an animal sacrifice, especially when eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life? And the life of an animal does not equal the life of a human. So it's by faith, it's by belief in Yahweh, in that Maseroth, in that plan of salvation, that gets us there. You must therefore know that those who trust in faith are the children of Abraham. Because Elohim knew in advance that the nations would be declared righteous through faith, he first preached to Abraham, as it is said in the Holy Scripture, in you shall all the nations be blessed. If we drop down to verse 13... Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, being disobedience, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone having been hung on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham <clears throat> might come on the nations through Yeshua Messiah, right? That the second Adam can now fulfill his job. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, right? Adam didn't believe. Adam didn't have faith. The second man did. Now look at verse 15. It's a very interesting verse that Paul says, he says, my brothers, I speak as a man. Do you know in the Aramaic that says, I speak as the son of man. I speak as Ha'adon. I speak as the son of man. I speak as the son of man, even though it be a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no man can reject it or change anything in it. Now the promises which were made to Abraham and to his seed as a covenant... He did not say to your descendants as many, but to your descendants as one Messiah. And that's what I'm saying. It's very interesting because the word Zerah can mean the descendants as a whole to the whole house of Israel. And Paul is very clearly saying no. When he said to Abraham, I will bless your seed, he is not saying the house of Israel. He's saying one Messiah. Very, very clearly. And I say that the covenant which was previously confirmed by Elohim and Messiah cannot be rejected or repudiated and the promise nullified by the Levitical law that came 430 years later. And that's why it's got to be talking to the, about the Levitical law. It's the only law that came 430 years later after Abraham. Because in Genesis 26, 5, why was Abraham chosen? Because Abraham kept my statutes and my judgments and my Torah. So certainly Abraham had the Torah because it says it. He didn't have the Levitical law, which came 430 years later. For if the inheritance is through the Levitical law, it would not be as the fulfillment of promise, but Elohim gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then the, Levit the Levitical law? It was placed beside the Torah for the sake of transgressions until the seed should come, to whom it had been promised, being given by promise in a mediator's hand. Right. So until the seed shall come. So here we see it's promised in Genesis 3.15 there's going to be a seed. And Noah, Noah gives the same promise. Why? Because he kept his seed, he kept his genealogy straight. From Noah we see Abraham comes, and Yahweh promises to Abraham through the Maseroth 
that he will have that seed. And right here, Paul is telling us, it's not talking about all of Israel, it's talking about the Messiah. Now the Messiah comes, everything's for finished. Now the second Adam is here, and we can go back to Genesis 3. We could start the work again. And what does he tell us the exact work is? The work is bearing fruit for the kingdom. That's what the work is. Go out and multiply and fill the land very, very, very clearly. One seed, the second Adam, through Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, Yeshua. From Genesis 3 until the New Testament, everything is about lineage. But now it's not about lineage. And that's why the, the sign of the covenant is different. The sign of the first covenant had to be circumcision because it was about a physical lineage. You had to physically see the circumcised physical body to know he's part of that lineage. But now in the new covenant, now that we're back to the purpose of man, it's about being a new creation. It's about going to the nations the way that Ha'adon was supposed to and bringing them into Eden. We don't need circumcision as a sign anymore because the second Adam is common. The second Adam has conquered. The second Adam has prevailed. Ezekiel 33 and verse 7, another interesting scripture here. Because there's a term that's used from the beginning, the son of Adom, right? The son of man, the son of Adom. And we see this a lot throughout Scripture. Ezekiel 33, 7 says, And you, Ben Adom, you Ben Adom, I gave you as a watchman to the house of Israel, and you shall hear the word from my mouth and warn them from me. So it's really interesting. That word is used a lot in Ezekiel, Ben Adom. So what is Yahweh saying? He's saying, son of man, son of Adam, was sent to the watchman, to the sons of Adam. <laughs> you know, he's sent to the sons of Adam, and he's the son, singular to the plural. But literally right there, Ben Adom, the son of man. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, talking about Yeshua, in a glorified sense, as the son of man. I was looking in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of the heavens, and he came to the ancients of days, and they brought him near before him. And dominion was given to him, to the Son of Man, and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, which will not be destroyed. How can anybody doubt that that's Yeshua? The Son of Man, very, very clearly doing. Matthew 9, Matthew 9, verse 1. Matthew 9 and verse 1. And entering into the boat, he passed over and came into his own city. And behold, there were bringing a paralytic lying on a cot to him. And seeing their faith, he said to the paralyzed one, Be comforted, child, your sins are forgiven you. Right? In the new covenant, it's all about faith. Because that's the thing that Ha'adon, the first Adam, lacked. And that's the thing that Abraham had, and that's the thing that was needed into the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, this one blasphemes. And seeing their thoughts, Yeshua said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Is it easy to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? But that you may know that the son of man, Ha'adom, the B'nai Adom, the son of Adam, has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic rising up, lift up your cot and go to your house. So, you know, sometimes I wondered, why, why was Yeshua called Son of Man and also Son of Elohim? And until this study on the purpose of man, I never really understood it, but now I clearly understood it. Because he had to be the Son of Adam. He had to be the literal seed of Adam to conquer with Adam lost. And what's really interesting about that, I mean, we see the lineage, if we go to Luke 3, why else would the lineage in Luke 3 be the way it is? Luke 3, in verse 23, And Yeshua himself was beginning to be about 30 years old, being, in parentheses, who was thought to be the son of Joseph. So he's not the son of Joseph. He was thought to be the son of Heli, that's the father of Miriam, the mother, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jana, the son of Joseph. Again, lineage. And why is the lineage here? Because the lineage has to be for the purpose of man. But look as it goes all the way down. Let's get to verse 34. The son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, 
the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Zerub, the son of Re, the son of Pele, the son of Eber, the son of Salah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arpazad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, El, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of Yahweh. Wow. Talk about the purpose of man right there, right? Wouldn't we say before? The first ten names, man is appointed moral sorrow, but the blessed Elohim shall come down teaching that his death will bring the long death to rest. That's why these names are in here. Because it had to show his connection to Adam, to Yahweh. Wow. Talk about the purpose of man. Yeshua's lineage, son of Adam, son of Yahweh. After Yeshua, there's no lineage. None. Zero. You don't see any lineage after the second Adam prevails. Why? Because what was the purpose of Adam to go in the world and bring those people in? Yahweh's not a respective person. You don't need lineage to be grafted in. You only needed lineage when the first Adam failed because the second Adam had to be from his seed. That's the only purpose for lineage. It's not that Yahweh thinks more or less of anybody else. He had to redeem what Adam lost. He couldn't fail to Satan. But once Yeshua redeemed it. Lineage is not important anymore. Because what's the lineage now? Well, first of all, Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb of Yah slain from the foundation of the world. So this was not something new in Yahweh's eyes. From creation, he knew it was going to work out this way. He knew that man would fail without his spirit. And he knew it. And that's why Yeshua had, as Melchizedek priest, he had to kill the first animal, Genesis 3, 21. But Galatians 3 and verse 26, why is lineage not important anymore? Galatians 3 verse 26, for you are all sons of Yahweh, B'nai Elohim, right? You are sons of Elohim, B'nai Elohim, through faith in Yeshua Messiah. And that's why I think B'nai Elohim is more about the children of Yahweh than they are talking about cherubs. You were B'nai Elohim through faith in Yeshua Messiah. For as many as were baptized into Messiah put on Messiah. There cannot be Jew nor Aramean. There is not slave nor free man. There is not male or female. You are all one ikad united in Messiah Yeshua. And if you were of the Messiah, then you were seeds of Abraham, even heirs according to the promise. So once the, once the second Adam came and he's doing his job, we don't need lineage anymore. And that's why we have to be careful. Because yes, is the plan of Yahweh to call back the tribes of Israel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's something he started. It's a promise to Abraham through his physical seed, and it's something Yahweh's doing. What we have to be careful for is that we cannot get the mindset that through physical lineage something is owed to us. And I see this a lot in the Ephraimite movement. People thinking that they have a right to this land because they can prove their uh, lineages to one of the tribes, whatever. But you know what? All that does is give you a death penalty. Because <laughs> all the tribes have a death penalty. The only way to get eternal life is through this lineage. Through the lineage of the second Adam. Not the first Adam. And that's why it shows you there, the lineage in Matthew is a lineage to death. And the only way that Matthew's lineage comes to life is through the Leverite law. Of, of, of Yosef, the stepfather of Yeshua, raising his seed of Yeshua for Miriam's father, who only had the one child, Miriam. And through that, through Miriam being the only child and him raising Yeshua, he raised seed to Yeshua from Miriam's father, and in doing so, grafted all of Matthew and that cursed twine back into salvation. Talk about how great Yahweh is. And there's people who try to use Matthew's genealogy to prove Yeshua is not the Messiah, because it has the cursed line in there, coming from Jeconiah. Right? But Yahweh has a way of working everything for the good. And that lineage is there because our lineage is not through physical lineage of being of one of the tribes of Israel. Our lineage is through Yeshua. That's the lineage. And that's why you have to Yeshua. No more lineage. You don't need lineage. That's the only lineage that we have. You, if you were in Messiah, you were seeds of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Very, very clearly. John 3 and verse 12. John 3 and verse 12. 
And how much greater does this stand out when we understand the purpose of man and the, the lineage? If I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has gone up into heaven except he hath coming down out of heaven, the Son of Man. B'nai Adon is he who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the son of, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone believing into him should not be destroyed but have everlasting life. For Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right, B'nai Elohim, that everyone believing into him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Yahweh did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might have life through him. The one believing into him, Yeshua, is not condemned, but the one not believing has already been condemned, for he has not believed into the name of the only begotten Son of Yahweh. Right? The name Elohim. So it's very, very clearly there is not another road to salvation. The first Adam, a physical man, failed. The second Adam, the Son out of heaven, conquered. So you choose what lineage you want to belong to, and that's why people who want to be circumcised to join the covenant, you're making a big, great mistake. Because you're joining a covenant of death, the first covenant, where there wasn't eternal life. No, you want to be baptized because you want to have a renewal of life. The baptism is the first Adam dying, the second Adam coming alive. The same as us. Each of us in our old life was like the first Adam. We failed in the flesh, but now we can conquer through the Spirit. And what do we want to be? Do we want to be like the first Adam, or do we want to be like the second Adam? Romans 5. Romans 5. Now let's read again what we read the last time. This contrast between the first and the second Adam. Romans 5, starting in verse 8. But Elohim commends his love to us in, in this, that we yet being sinners, Messiah died for us. Right? So you, Messiah died while we were yet sinners. Much more than being justified now by his blood, we shall be delivered from wrath through him. For if while being enemies we were reconciled to Elohim through the death of his son, how much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And that's why the baptism is a dying to the old self and a living to the new self. And it's not through animal sacrifice, but it's being a living sacrifice with Messiah living through us. And it's bearing fruit the way the first Adam did it, but the, the way the second Adam did. And not only so, but also glorying in Yahweh through our Master Yeshua Messiah, through whom we now receive the atonement being at one with Yahweh, being a God. Even as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, so also death passed to all men inasmuch as all sinned, right? It's not that there's original sin. People are, the, the sins of the fathers don't go to the sons, the sins of the sons don't go to the fathers. Each person's accountable for their own sin. But if that first person knows what's right and what's wrong and doesn't share it with the other people, then ultimately by the lack of the Spirit of Yahweh, there these people will. So death passed to all men, men inasmuch as they all sinned. For sin was in the world into the Torah, but sin is not charged where there is no instruction. Yet death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned after the likeness of the transgression of the Torah by Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not also like the offense. For if by the offense of one the many died, how much more the grace and gift of Elohim because of one man, Yeshua Messiah, be increased for many. And the effect of the gift of Elohim was greater than the effect of the offense of Adam. For while the judgment of one man's offense resulted in the condemnation of many, but the free gift of Elohim and the forgiveness of sin resulted in the justification of many. And think about this. Let's say Adam passed the test. Let's say he didn't show lack of faith in Yahweh, and he did go out to the world to these people. People still had free will, and they didn't have the spirit of Yahweh. So we don't know how many people would have taken it. The key is with the second Adam, he's given us the spirit of Yahweh. That's the thing that changes our heart. So think now with all the believers that have been here the last 2,000 years, how many would have became believers without the spirit of Yahweh? Some maybe, but not many. If Yahweh didn't give us a spirit and we had the same exact message of truth and uh, the sacrifice of Yeshua, how many of us would have been able to change without the spirit of Yahweh? Very, very few, if any. So this is why this is really important to understand 
that it's not just the offense of Adam failing in faith and not going out. It's also the greatness of the second Adam having something greater to give than the first Adam by the Spirit of Yahweh. The effect of the gift, verse 16, of Elohim was greater than the effect of the offense. Right? So it's not just looking and saying, oh, if Adam would have only done that. No, because Yahweh's able to take the worst situation and make it into the best situation. And everything worked. The Lamb of Yah slain from the foundation of the world. So in the, in the flesh, man will always fail. Man will always fail. But in the spirit, with the spirit of Yahweh, we can overcome. The effect of the gift of Elohim was greater than the effect of the offense of Adam. For while the judgment of one man's offense resulted in the condemnation of many... But the free gift of Elohim and the forgiveness of sins resulted in justification to many more. For if by the offense of one, death reigned through the one, much more those who are receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall rule in life by the one Yeshua Messiah. Therefore, as on account of the offense of one, therefore on the account of the offense of one, condemnation was to all men, so on account of the righteousness of one will the victory unto life be to all men. For as on account of disobedience of one man many became sinners, so also on account of the obedience of one many become righteous. So I think it takes a whole different meaning when we understand the difference of the first Adam to the second Adam. And then of course, when you're looking at that seed, why now doesn't seed matter anymore? Because like we read in Galatians, if you be in Messiah, you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the, the, the promises. And you're not only a seed of Abraham, you're literally a part of the second Adam. You're literally a part of his body. Ephesians 5, uh, 5 Ephesians 5 and verse 25. That's why we don't need a lineage. Our lineage is the Messiah's lineage. We are the same body that he is. He is the head and we are the body. Husbands, love your wife, even as Messiah loved the congregation and gave himself on its behalf, that he might sanctify it, cleansing it by the washing of water in the word, that he might present it to himself as the glorious congregation, not having stain or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives, even as their own bodies. He loving his wife loves himself. For then no man hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even also as our master does to the congregation. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one. This is a great mystery, but I speak as to Messiah and the congregation. So why? Why did Hava, Eve, have to come out of Adam, but every other woman was born normally? Every other marriage was a husband and wife. But why was the original Adam, the woman, had to come out of him? Because they're bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh. They're one body. And the second Adam, we are part of that one body. It's the same analogy. We are part of him. And that's why. Forget lineage. Forget what tribe you're from. Forget all of these physical things. Trying to go back to the Levitical law. You know, they, they had a big conference here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the Sanhedrin that has started here, they're talking about starting animal sacrifices again, and believers want to be part of it. They're thinking it's the greatest thing in the world. And it's the abomination of desolation when this comes. So we want to make sure we're understanding we are part of the very body of the Messiah. That's the great mystery, that we are the bride of Messiah, and that's what it comes from. 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12. 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12. Even as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of the one body being many are one body, so is the Messiah. Like I said, that's why Hava Eve comes out of Adam. Because they're the same body, bone of bone, flesh of flesh, the same as we are the same body of Messiah. And that's why 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24, this is why every Pesach, what do we do? For as received from the Master, I delivered to you that the Master Yeshua in the night he was betrayed took bread. And giving thanks, he broke it and said, Take this. This is my body which is broken on behalf of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And even the Apostle Paul made a comment of uh, completing the afflictions of Messiah in his own body. And we see it today. You know, we see it. Brethren all over the world going through suffering, persecution, martyrism. And they're part of our very body because they're part of the body of Messiah. 
We partake of the symbolism of the body of Messiah Passover because we're part of his lineage. We're part of this very body. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 35. 1 Corinthians 15, 35. And this is what we have to understand. The same way that Yeshua said to the Father in Matthew 26, 39, not my will be done, but your will be done. Because Yeshua was literally, he's literally at one with the Father through the one spirit. We have to think the same way. We have to surrender our free will. And we have to be totally one in mind and spirit with Yeshua the same way he is with the Father. Corinthians 15 and verse 35. But someone will say, how, do, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow the body that is going to be, but a bare grain, it may be of wheat or barley or some other seed. And Elohim gives it a body according as he will, in each of the seeds, its own natural body. And not every flesh is the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another of beast, another of fish, another of birds. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is truly different, and that of the earthly different. One glory to the sun, another to the moon, another to the stars, for stars differ from star and glory. Also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So here it is, right? You know, the first Adam was flesh, the second Adam is spirit. What do we want to be? But the spiritual first, not the, but not the spiritual first, but the natural afterward, the spiritual. The first man was out of earth earthly, the second man was the master Yahweh out of heaven. As is the earthly, so are the earthly ones. As is the heavenly, so are the heavenly ones. But as we bore the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly one, right? We're made in his image, we'll be in his likeness if we surrender and allow the spirit of Yeshua to overtake us. And change us. And as we bore the image of the earthly, we also bear the likeness of the heavenly one. And brothers, I say, flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of Yahweh, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Then he talks about at the last Trump uh, being resurrected. We are the seed of Messiah, the seed of Adam, man. We need to bear the fruit and multiply and fill Eden, Eden which is the presence of Yahweh. John 15. John 15, verse 1. I am the vine, my father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, not bearing fruit, he takes away, and everyone bearing fruit, he prunes, so it may bear more fruit. You are already pruned because the word which I've spoken to you, right? The seed is the word of Yahweh. Remain in me and I in you, as the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself, Unless I remain in the vine, neither can you, unless you remain in me. We're part of his body. You can't cut your finger off and think it's going to go or remain. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and him, this man will produce plentiful fruit, because without me, you are not able to do anything. Verse 8. In this my Father is glorified that you should bear much fruit, and you will be my disciples. So that's, that's the purpose of man. The purpose of man is to bear fruit and multiply and fill the land. It's the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Having gone, disciple all nations. You know, Yeshua coming up talking with them. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Having gone, disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded. This is the purpose of man. The commission has never changed. Yahweh is colonizing the earth, making literal children to fill Eden, which is being in his presence. The second Adam is finished with his work of redemption. After 1,000 millennial reign, Yahweh the Father will come back to the earth, and the earth will be full as Eden. The first covenant was about lineage, and that's why the sign was circumcision. The new covenant is about rebirth. The second Adam, the sign is baptism. Only after the seed of the Redeemer, the second Adam, came, could the plan once again go to redeem the entire earth. Before the entire earth to be redeemed, the seed of Adam, the first redeemer, had to be redeemed first. So ending in Joel 3, in verse 2, a fire devours before them and the flames behind them. 
The land is the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them is a desolate wilderness. It's all about lineage. The first Adam's lineage, which failed, and then the second Adam in lineage, and your lineage as a grafted-in child to Adam and Yahweh's family. What an awesome purpose of man. Yahweh bless. Shabbat shalom.